Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. My name is Eric Trexler. I am the special temporary primary host, and today I have the great pleasure of being joined by Greg Knuckles. He is currently the permanent guest co-host uh, for the time being. Greg, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing great. Uh, we have a lot of great topics to cover in today's episode, but before we get to that, if you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to support it, there are many ways you could do that. You could like, rate, or subscribe wherever you get podcasts. You could join our email newsletter by going to strongerbyscience.com slash newsletter. You could use our discount code at bulksupplements.com. The code is SBSPOD, and that gets you a 5% discount off of your order. You could subscribe to the Mass Research Review, which we are both co-authors of. Or, finally, you could check out Macro Factor, which is the diet app that we developed. It does have a free trial, so if you want to take it for a spin and see if you like it, there is no risk involved. Uh, road to the stage, Greg. How's it going? Uh, road to the stage is going well. Uh, it was supposed to be put on pause over this over this past uh, eh, half a week or so. Um, took a little trip with uh, with Lindsay. Just you know, bit of time to to chill out, decompress, etc. Uh, wasn't tracking food. Uh, wasn't working out. Just chilling. Just you know, trying to eat mindfully, not completely fall off the wagon. And uh, yeah, went better than I anticipated it to. Uh, got back last night, woke up today at a new at a new all time low weight. So uh, yeah, still still chugging along, uh, even though I did not expect it to be. So oh, overall, things are pretty good. So what do you attribute that to? Do you think it was just kind of staying active and staying busy com combined with a little bit of mindful eating? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always tend to find that whenever I'm uh, dieting, if I can find a, you know, if I have a weekend or a week here or there where I'm just super busy and my, my brain is on activities rather than food and I'm moving around all day. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have these nice little surprises. Yeah. So nice to see. Yes, sir. Uh, so on the road to Athens, on my side of things, uh, nothing new. I'm really enjoying training a lot, which is kind of you know, for a while there, you know, if, if you stick with training long enough, you have your ups and downs where sometimes you're just going through the motions and sometimes you're really enthusiastic mm -hmm. and enjoying it. So for the first time in actually quite a while, I'm really enjoying training, which is fun. Uh, I did have a minor, like very, very minor setback where I noticed that I kind of aggravated some of my symptoms. Um, I kind of went off script and did a bunch of stuff that I maybe wasn't necessarily supposed to do. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like if you can test your, this definitely isn't advice, but you know, for me personally, if I test my boundaries a little bit and I get a little slap on the wrist, you know, just a little bit of aggravation, but not, you know, anything major, I think it can be helpful to kind of learn those boundaries so that you can readjust and kind of reassess moving forward. You know, mm -hmm. if you never test those boundaries in any way, then sometimes you get stuck in that cycle where you're just afraid of movement and you're never trying new things. You're never trying to get back into your normal training. For sure. Uh, so there, there's a little bit of a, you know, there, there's kind of a fine line where pushing those boundaries a little bit within safe constraints is a good thing. Uh, but, you know, just being completely rec reckless, probably not a great thing when you're trying to recover from something. So overall, you know, pretty happy about it. Not a big deal. Uh, how about feats of strength? What do we got this week? Yeah. So, uh, CPU nationals, uh, is coming up soon. That's the Canadian, uh, IPF powerlifting affiliate. Uh, and in the lead up to CPU nationals, uh, Jessica Bittner has deadlifted 250 for a double, uh, that's in kilos so 551 pounds and has squatted, uh, 220, which is 484, 485, if memory serves, uh, she currently holds the world records in her weight class with a 210 squat and 250 deadlift. So it looks like she is primed to potentially blow both of those numbers out of the water, uh, assuming her peak and everything goes well, which I fully expect it to. Um, she is coached by frenemy of the pod, Eric Helms. Uh, and, you know, he... It's nice that she's doing so well in spite of that. That is true. That is true. <laughs> um... But to push back against that a little bit, uh, you know, Eric knows how to to bring people into a meet and peak them well. So, 
you know, all all of the stars seem to be aligned for some huge numbers out of her. Uh, we're recording this on Monday. CPU Nationals is starting today. Uh, and I believe Jessica's flight will go on Friday. So the day after this episode comes out. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in potentially seeing a huge squat and deadlift world record in the women's 76 kilo class, uh, tune in and check that out. That's awesome. And I'd like to add a feat of strength this week. A huge major shout out to the tree next to my house. Um, <laughs> just a really clutch and impressive feat of strength. So uh, we had a tornado watch for like six hours the other day. There were some nasty storms that rolled through and everything seemed fine. You know, no big deal. But I went out the next morning and realized that one of the pine trees in my yard like a full grown pine tree had just completely snapped in half and looked like it had crushed my roof. Mm -hmm. But then upon further inspection, it appeared that a tree that was kind of in the way had like just barely cradled the fallen tree so that it was like still touching my house. But like, man, if that tree was a little shorter or a little weaker, the one that caught the other tree. Yeah. Uh, that that fallen pine tree would have just like demolished my home. Uh, so I'm still not really sure like the extent of the damage. I got to go up on the roof and figure out how we did there. But like the fact that my home isn't like semi collapsed is is kind of a miracle. So absolutely huge shout out to the tree that caught the other tree in my side yard. Just a really impressive feat of strength. That that is pretty clutch. Uh. One thing I'll note that maybe Jessica has over the tree in your yard mm -hmm. is that she is a Macro Factor affiliate. Uh, she's been using that to to track and manage her weight and nutrition uh, for, I think, like the last six months at this point. Uh, but anyway, if you want to extend your free trial and show Jessica some love, her uh, affiliate code is Forklift. Enter that at checkout and you can extend your one week free trial into a two week free trial. All right. Very good stuff. Um, so in terms of the hard hitting scientific content this week, I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about fiber. So just like a really brief research review about fiber, um, because we've kind I think I've mentioned this or alluded to it on the show previously, but, uh, it's kind of unprecedented times when it comes to fiber in the nutrition world these days, like Going back, there were few things that had almost unanimous and universal acceptance in the nutrition world. And one of those very few things was like, hey, fiber, pretty good, pretty nice thing. Uh, but nowadays it's getting some pushback, you know, like even when, even when keto had its, its heyday, when it was getting huge at like, you know, 2012 to 2014, everybody in fitness was, you know, uh, becoming aware of it and becoming intrigued by it. Even then, a lot of the keto recommendations were like, you know, how much carb should I have? And it's like, well, you want to make sure you get your fiber in. So just have enough like fibrous vegetables to take care of that. And you'll probably be about where you need to be, yeah. you know? So even when keto was really accelerating, people were like, well, wait a minute, let's not blame all carbs. Let's get all, get our, our fiber in. But now that the carnivore diet is getting more and more attention, it is uh, naturally coming with some uh, interesting claims about fiber, right? Mm -hmm. So if you tell somebody, hey, like most, if not all of your diet should be coming from, you know, muscle tissue and other tissue of animals, uh, intuitively or, you know, a natural consequence of that is someone's going to say, well, hey, what, a what about fiber, yeah. you know? And so, you know, you it's really difficult to promote a carnivore diet without having some kind of talking points prepared where you can address, you know, that, that big, uh, gap in the diet, which is where is the fiber going to come from? Mm -hmm. So now more than ever, you're seeing stuff on the internet, uh, on social media in particular, suggesting that maybe fiber isn't actually good. Uh, maybe there is no reason related to health or wellness. Uh, to consume fiber in your diet. Maybe it's completely unnecessary. And I've even seen, I've, I've seen some people take it as far as to say that that dietary fiber might even have a net negative impact when included in the diet. Uh, so 
people are seeing that more and more, interacting with it more and more. And, you know, I, I think a very natural reaction is like, wow, that's so surprising and so contradictory to everything I've heard about fiber. Uh, I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I cannot believe it. Uh, <laughs> it because it's not really an evidence-based take. So I wanted to take a moment to kind of uh, just kind of highlight some of the benefits of fiber in the diet. I don't want to belabor the point because I think most people are already bought into this, but but it can induce a little bit of uh, you know a little bit of confusion or cognitive dissonance where on one half of your uh, Instagram feed you see all this positive stuff about fiber, and then on the other half you see uh, you know a bunch of stuff saying oh actually fiber is pretty bad. And the reason I wanted to address this was because I recently covered fiber in a, a research review in, in mass. So I was covering a review that was looking at a fiber restricted diet, uh, but it was specifically in the context of a short term weight cut. So you could imagine if you were cutting out that those last few pounds before uh, a wrestling match or before a powerlifting meet, or you know maybe even if you wanted to do that before a, a physique based competition, there are some applications of these fiber restricted diets. And we're talking about taking your fiber down from, you know, I think a lot of people in the fitness world are, are in the 30, 40, 50 gram a day range. We're talking about taking that all the way down to single digits for two, three, four, maybe five days in a row. Mm -hmm. And so there is research, including the, the study I reviewed in mass uh, within the last month or two, indicating that a short term fiber restricted diet uh, can be a helpful thing when it comes to short-term weight cutting. You know, it's not going to have a huge effect, but you might see just a little bit of a drop in total body mass, which of course is to be expected when you start restricting fiber. Uh, basically what happens is the content of uh, digested food stuff in your GI tract goes down a little bit. You kind of clear out your system. That's why for certain gastrointestinal procedures, they will have you kind of restrict food intake and fiber intake so that you can basically clear out your system for, for various medical procedures and yeah. uh, diagnostic procedures. Um, so, so there's really nothing new there, but one of the things that uh, the, the researchers noted in that study was this is not a long-term dietary solution. So the fact that short-term, you know, two, three, four, five days of fiber restriction, the fact that that can be implemented successfully for weight cutting does not mean, hey, why don't you just do that forever and stay a pound or two lighter than normal in perpetuity? Yeah. Um, and so just briefly, like I'm going to link a couple review papers in the show notes for people who want to dig into the details. Like I said, I don't want to belabor the point because I, I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. Um, but there was a great review by Anderson and colleagues where they kind of highlighted the research indicating that high fiber intake is associated with lower risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and certain gastrointestinal diseases. Uh, there was also a different review paper by Barber and colleagues where they pointed out that fiber is inversely associated with all-cause mortality, along with mortality from cardiovascular disease and all cancers overall. And of course, a lot of times people hear that and they say, okay, correlation, association, that's all observational, that's a bunch of crap. Uh, but there is a pretty strong mechanistic, mechanistic basis from randomized controlled trials by which you can really clearly draw a line uh, between a causative mechanism that is reliably induced by high fiber intake and the types of outcomes that we're seeing in these studies. So uh, when it comes to fiber, it is a very strong and very comprehensive case for the fact that fiber, by and large, has a very positive impact in the diet. And if you're wondering what an advisable intake for fiber might be, a very basic recommendation that you see all the time is about 14 grams of fiber per thousand calories in the diet. So for a 2000 calorie diet, that would be 28 grams of fiber per day, for example. And the reason that they scale that recommendation to caloric intake is because as anyone who's done some pretty restrictive dieting has observed, it can be really hard to get high fiber intake on a very low calorie diet. Mm -hmm. I still try my best to do that. Um, like, you know, if, if I'm down on a, you know, 15, 1800 calorie diet, I do try to get higher than that 14 per thousand calorie number. 
um, just to try to stay close to my typical fiber intake. Uh, but without question, it gets very, very challenging because where there's fiber, you're usually going to find other non-fiber carbohydrate that's going to come with it. So when you start cutting carbs and total calories out of your diet, a lot of times you will see that the fiber tends to go with it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, fiber is, is really fascinating in terms of its impact on a variety of different uh, health outcomes. Um, and there's even some less obvious associations that have been observed. So some studies have found that fiber intake is associated with better immune function, lower chronic inflammation levels, and even a lower risk of depression. And those are some of the outcomes where it gets a little bit harder to draw a really strong mechanistic link. Uh, but I do think one fascinating kind of uh, related area of research is in the realm of short chain fatty acids. So when we consume dietary fiber uh, and other non-digestible or partially digestible carbohydrates, uh, when those start to ferment in the digestion process, uh, what we see is that they, uh, they, they do lead to the production of several different short chain fatty acids and other associated metabolites. And those short chain fatty acids and similar metabolites, uh, they do seem to have some pretty wide ranging physiological effects that we are in the process of elucidating and, and fully starting to understand, but we're really not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so I remember uh, a few years back, uh, I dug into the research on short chain fatty acids and uh, it's a very, very fascinating body of literature, but it, it's ki it kind of reminds me a bit of if you were to dig into the gut microbiome literature right now, mm -hmm. you can see the glimpses of like, okay, this is definitely important in in some capacity but the question is how do we make that useful how do we act upon that yeah a and for what things is it truly causative so there's there's much to be learned there but basically what i wanted to do with this segment was uh kind of highlight the fact that uh you've not lost your mind despite what you're seeing more and more on social media fiber uh within the academic world and within the world of anyone working clinically in nutrition fiber is still embraced as a very, very uh, healthful addition to the diet within the types of intakes that I've described. Yeah. Um, now, one thing I should acknowledge is that there are some instances with certain gut-related pathologies and clinical conditions where short-term fiber reduction is part of the treatment process. So if you go in to uh, seek medical treatment for uh, certain specific gastrointestinal conditions, they might for a time put you on a pretty restrictive diet that eliminates a lot of fibrous foods. Um, but when you look into the clinical literature about those types of interventions, uh, it's almost always framed as a short-term elimination diet with the purpose uh, where you, you do that elimination diet, you remove foods that could be exacerbating symptoms. And once you reach a point where symptoms have subsided, you start reintroducing foods and generally building fiber back up to a tolerable level. Yeah. So a lot of people have looked into some of these short-term interventions of fiber restriction and said, oh man, if fiber is so bad for your gut, I'm just going to restrict it all the time. Uh, and that would be a misapplication of that research and generally an inadvisable thing to do, especially if you already have uh, an otherwise healthy functioning GI system with no symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th that's like saying uh, super strenuous exercise is contraindicated immediately following a heart attack. Therefore, no one should ever do strenuous exercise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's a, a complete misapplication. Yeah. And, and one other thing I'll note uh, just before you move on, because I, I see what's coming up next in the outline, um, is I feel like I feel like th this is a topic where you know, let's assume that the skeptics are correct and that it is just pure, that it is mere correlation. There's no causative factors whatsoever. Um, you know, and it, and it is what it is. I still feel like even in, even in a situation like that, and I'm not saying that that's what I believe to be the case. I'm, I'm just saying like, let's play devil's advocate and assume that is true. If you tell someone, uh, you know, Hey, try to get more fiber in your diet. Um, and especially if you generally promote uh, trying to get, you know, most of your nutrition in from whole food sources, then you just ask, like, 
well, okay, what, uh, what dietary changes would they potentially be making? And then it's like, well, let's just look at what foods have a lot of fiber, like lots of fibrous vegetables, most fruits, uh, most seeds, nuts, stuff like that, like things that are, you know, generally understood and believed to have other health promoting effects. And so, you know, even if this is just mere correlation where it's like, oh, well, it turns out that a lot of the people who eat a lot of fiber are also, you know, it's it's because they're eating a lot of these other foods and maybe like some other nutrients in the foods are having the positive effects, not the fiber per se. Then, you know, I feel like you could you could potentially hit a pothole with the fiber recommendation if someone's like, oh, well, OK, I'll. Just keep eating the way I'm currently eating, but just take some psyllium husk. But if they're going to be getting the fiber in mostly from whole food sources, uh, aiming for fiber intake can kind of work just as a general heuristic that would promote other just generally beneficial dietary patterns, whether or not fiber is the causative factor. So yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I do think fiber in and of itself is having an independent positive effect. But even if I didn't, I still don't know that the fiber recommendation wouldn't still be a good recommendation to give. Yeah, that, that's an important clarification. I, I kind of mentioned that in the mass article, but I forgot to bring it up in this segment. But it's definitely true. And it reminds me of like, whenever I talk about dietary nitrate, uh, I usually recommend getting it from food, uh, mm -hmm. from plant sources rather than dietary supplements. And usually what I say is, listen, this research isn't fully conclusive yet for performance benefits. Um, but let's say you take my advice and you start eating more spinach and arugula and celery and beets and maybe a little bit of pomegranate. You're better off. Like you're, you're in a good spot there. Like yeah. there's all upside and no downside uh, when, when it comes to that shift in dietary pattern. And the same thing is true. If you tell somebody, hey, you know, try to get at least 14 grams per thousand calories try to get it from whole food sources, it's very, very likely that they're going to be adopting a more uh, health promoting dietary pattern, whether or not the dietary fiber has a damn thing to do with it. Mm -hmm. So th that's a really important clarification for sure. Um, and yeah, like, like I said, it, it's not like we're just looking at these observational findings and saying, well, we have no idea what's going on, but it looks good for you know, diabetes or, or heart disease or whatever the case may be. I mean, we do have the randomized controlled trials indicating improvements in glycemic control, improvements in blood lipid, blood lipid profiles. I mean, this is a, a real, in a world of nutrition research where it's hard to find really comprehensive bodies of literature where everything seems to add up, fiber is one of those things where you can make some pretty safe bets with fiber. Mm -hmm. Uh, so getting ahead of a few claims, some specific claims that you might see out there. Number one, like I mentioned, a lot of people are saying that fiber isn't necessary. And a lot of times they frame that by saying fiber is not essential in the dietary context. And when we talk about something being uh, essential for nutrition, that basically means your body can't make it. You need to get it from food in order to function uh, in, in a healthy way, right? So like if, for example... If you are severely lacking an essential fatty acid or an essential amino acid, that is going to down the line lead to pathological states, uh, you know, where where you have clinical clinically relevant negative outcomes due to that uh, that deficiency. Uh, now, with fiber, it is not essential in that context. You are not going to acutely die from a fiber deficiency. It's simply not going to happen. But like I said. Uh, not acutely dying from a deficiency uh, is one thing, but it's a completely different thing to say, what is a healthy, you know, health promoting dietary pattern that seems to be compatible with reducing my risk of mortality and various chronic diseases. And so you could not say that fiber restriction is going to acutely kill you due to deficiency, but you definitely can make a very strong case that seeking an appropriate amount of fiber in the diet is going to be correlated with a lot of very positive health outcomes uh, when compared to a lower fiber intake. Number two, I've seen a lot of people um, sharing a couple specific studies indicating that fiber does not always cure constipation. 
So like there's a couple random or there's a couple um, papers where they do a high fiber intervention in patients who are experiencing constipation at baseline. Uh, and they're just trying to say like, hey, is this a super reliable treatment intervention for this specific uh, presentation of constipation? Uh, but it's important to remember there are two very different questions that relate to this. So first, you might ask, is increasing fiber a reliable treatment intervention for intractable cases of constipation? So people who have tried the over-the-counter stuff and they're like, man, I just can't, you know, I can't sort out this constipation. The symptoms are very persistent. That's one question. But another question is, what happens to fecal consistency and bowel movement frequency when a healthy asymptomatic person intentionally restricts their fiber? And the reason I bring up these two different questions is because a lot of people who do not have persistent intractable constipation are using these intervention studies to say, see, fiber doesn't even help you poop anyway, mm -hmm. right? But what we see in the studies, so for example, the study I recently reviewed in mass is when the individuals did this aggressive fiber restriction in this study, uh, in a controlled setting, what we saw was uh, a shift in stool hardness that was uh, very consistent with constipation symptoms, a reduction in bowel movement frequency, and a shift in stool type uh, using a specific scale. I think it's called the Bristol stool scale, mm -hmm. where you can kind of look at pictures and say, yeah, my poop looks like that one. Uh, it's numbered, I think, one through seven or something like that. So when we take a healthy person who is not experiencing constipation, who's just kind of having their normal habitual fiber intake, and we encourage them to intentionally restrict it, we do see unfavorable changes in fecal consistency, stool type, and bowel movement frequency, generally all trending toward uh, a, a cluster of changes that are fairly consistent with mild constipation symptoms. Uh, so it's really important not to take some of those intervention studies out of context and apply them in a completely different context. Uh, the final thing I wanna mention when you see some of these claims about fiber being useless or even deleterious, usually you'll see claims about how plants are just generally bad because they have compounds that are intended to deter pre uh, predators from eating them. Uh, and that is true. Plants have uh, you know, certain compounds that are there to try to deter predators from threatening their ability to exist. That makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. And so, people will kind of make these points like, dude, you're literally eating lethal poisons that are intended to kill you if you eat this stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, if you were an insect, that would be very troubling. But as a human being, not quite as scary. Because like what we're talking about here is a nice spicy meal. Capsaicin is thought to be one of those compounds that deters predators from eating uh, certain plants. Uh, humans can eat spicy foods. It's not a big deal. It doesn't kill us. Uh, coffee has caffeine, a similar type of thing. Coffee, very lovely. It's a nice beverage. Uh, Turkesterone, everyone's favorite, literally causes insects to melt. Like it is like the most disastrous <laughs> instance of this. Yeah, f forces them to molt themselves to death. Yeah. And, to, and, to shed their skin before they have, or to shed their exoskeleton before they have a new exoskeleton ready to go so they just their their insides become their outsides yeah it, it literally causes them to spontaneously melt and fall apart and die uh so it, it nasty just nasty way to go it just kills me that on the two sides of the fitness industry right now i'm hearing some people say like oh man these plant toxins are so scary and other people are like dude if you're not taking ter terkesterone what are you even doing yeah and it's like there, there's no way to make these two different sides compatible um, and one of the things I mentioned is kind of like a, I was kind of like facetiously mocking this argument and I was like, what's next? Are you going to say that tea is bad? Cause like, you know, tea has caffeine and it's the same kind of thing as coffee. Like, uh, the evolutionary origin of caffeine, uh, has been proposed to be, to deter predators from consuming these plants. And then I literally saw a, a carnivore person with a huge following saying like, yeah, dude, avoid tea. It's really bad news. Was it that video of like Sean Sean Baker in a like Whole Foods with a shirt off? No, it was uh, it was or or wait, no, I it was uh, I think Saladino. Yeah, 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 Saladino. That's right, yeah, that's right. And like, dude, it 
to suggest that tea is deleterious for health, like to the point that you should call out like, hey, make sure you avoid tea. It's just, it's not simply a not evidence-based take. It is a full and complete rejection of all available evidence about tea. Yeah. Tea has been widely studied. Its effects are virtually unanimously neutral to positive on long-term health outcomes. The idea that it's something to be feared is honestly a bit silly. So that is my uh, long lecture about fiber. And in fact, everything that you believe to be true about fiber is in fact true. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if this is a long game to, uh, to like convince people that, no, I'm not a bad cook. I'm just trying to be healthy because most, uh, most like aromatics in herbs, um, aren't, aren't poison to plants, but are, uh, there to deter, uh, or, or aren't poison to insects, but are there to deter insects. Like, yeah. you know, that that's a thing you can do like in your yard or your garden, you can, if there's a place where you want people to be able to sit outside and not be messed with by insects, uh, you can just like plant a circle of aromatic herbs around them and that will do a decent job of keeping insects away for that reason. So like, you know, I, I wonder if these people are like, ah, oh, man, I don't, I don't know how spices work. Uh, what if I just tell everyone that I'm just trying to not poison them and that's, that's how I can get out of ever having to learn how to cook well. I mean, that's the thing is like, I am hurting myself by taking this position. I would love to say, yeah, spices, bad news. It's a terrible thing. Don't get into it. Cause that would justify everything I've ever said about cooking. Uh, <laughs> but in the interest of intellectual honesty, I gotta say, I don't think it's a strong point. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's getting a little bit silly to me. Um, but anyway, Moving on, Greg, I noticed that you had some things in the Q&A section that you wanted to uh, to make note of here. Yeah, yeah. So the, these aren't questions from particular people. It, it's mostly just responding to questions and feedback that have come after a couple of my recent segments. Um, so yeah, just, just wanted to uh, clear some things up. So in the most recent episode before this one, uh, I had a segment talking about the effects of oral contraception on uh, strength and hypertrophy outcomes. Um, you know, basically coming down on the side of, hey, when you look at all of the research, um, there are people out there saying that if you take uh, hormonal contraceptives, that's going to have a negative impact on strength and muscle growth. But the human evidence just doesn't back that up. There's no reliable evidence that that is the case. Um, and there's, you know, there's quite a few studies done at this point, like 10 papers from eight individual studies, if, if memory serves. And you just can't make an evidence-based case for oral contraception uh, having a negative impact on strength and hypertrophy outcomes. Like the, the human data just don't support that position. Um and so there have been, so I, I've seen a sentiment expressed a few times uh, that I was promoting oral contraceptives, and I, I want to make my intentions behind that segment clear. Um, so oral contraceptives are medication, and as with any medication, that's something for you and your doctor to talk about. And there, there are many things that you might want to talk about, potential side effects, uh, you know, just generally how it's going to make you feel different options that might, uh, you know, fit your lifestyle better, et cetera. Um, you know, there, there's a ton of stuff to talk about and I am simply in favor of when people are making decisions, helping them make the most informed decisions possible. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell anyone to take or not take oral contraceptives, but one one concern I have is that when you have that conversation with your doctor, there's going to be a ton of stuff that your doctor does know about and would be able to point you toward credible resources on, et cetera, et cetera. I am, and I could be wrong about this, but I'm somewhat doubtful that reproductive medicine doctors are really watching the literature on strength and hypertrophy super closely. Um, and so it's it's one of those things where, 
that might be kind of a blank spot for them, and very understandably so, of the of the dozens of things you might want to talk about uh, when it comes to family planning, reproductive choices, uh, various forms of contraception. You know, there, there's going to be plenty of things that doctors do need to know a lot about and conversations they're going to be having quite frequently in areas of research they're going to need to stay up to date on. They're probably not watching the strength and hypertrophy literature all that closely. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that might be a blind spot for some doctors. And so, you know, when you're making that decision, if potential impacts on training outcomes is something that you're concerned about, uh, I think that if you just pulled up a Google search or just scrolled down your social media feed for information on uh, hormonal contraceptives and their impact on strength and hypertrophy, I think you'd come across a lot of scaremongering and a lot of just general misinformation that is not congruent with the human evidence. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just wanted to make that segment uh, to help people be more informed about just that one aspect of the impact of, uh, of hormonal contraceptives and, you know, their potential impact or lack of impact on strength and hypertrophy outcomes. So people can make informed decisions for themselves. That was, that was the whole purpose of that segment. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about is going back, oh, maybe, maybe three episodes at this point. Uh, I talked about a meta-analysis looking at the dose-response relationship between uh, resistance training and all-cause mortality and uh, uh, various um, like etiologies of mortality. Uh, and one of the findings of that meta-analysis is that there's roughly a, a U-shaped relationship or a J-shaped relationship where... You know, some amount of resistance training seems to be associated with increased mortality, reductions in all-cause mortality, and then if uh, if the total amount of training performed gets high enough, then it might actually be associated with increased uh, all-cause mortality. Uh, and so, you know, th that was a long segment. There were a lot of rabbit holes we went down, a lot of nuance there. I'm not going to rehash all of that here. If you want to listen to that, it's I, I'm sure uh, lifting and mortality is, is something in the video title, shouldn't be hard to find. Um, but I wanted to respond to a, a common piece of feedback and a very understandable uh, piece of feedback that I got to that segment. And that is, uh, you know, people brought up, there are several meta-analyses at this point and, and just large uh, uh, individual observational studies finding that uh, higher levels of strength and higher levels of lean mass or, or appendicular lean mass or muscle mass are all associated with improved mortality outcomes. So, you know, the, the, the question, the obvious question is, you know, if being stronger or having more muscle is predictive of longevity, uh, why wouldn't doing a ton of resistance training to try to build as much strength and muscle as possible why wouldn't that also be super predictive of of uh, decreased all-cause mortality rates? Like, that's that's a very logical question to ask, and I understand where it's coming from. Uh, but first, one thing to note is that this sort of disconnect also exists within kind of the cardio and aerobic training literature, where... Uh, at least in some context, there seems to be a similar sort of U-shaped relationship between the actual cardio people do and all-cause mortality. So uh, this is coming specifically from the uh, Copenhagen City Heart Study, where they found that uh, uh, joggers had lower rates of all-cause mortality than non-joggers, and uh, the total volume of jogging people did, um, doing more and more, seemed to generally be a good thing, but the issue was intensity. So if you did quite a bit of low intensity jogging, that was very good. If you did quite a bit of moderate, moderate intensity jogging, that was still very good, but not quite as good as doing a whole lot of low intensity jogging. And if you did quite a lot of high intensity jogging, that was actually associated with, uh, uh, potentially higher, um, 
rates of all-cause mortality. So it, it's the same general sort of U-shaped relationship where, you know, maybe maybe this thing is good, but maybe it's not so good if you overdo it. Um, and much like with the findings that more strength, more muscle seems to be associated with lower rates of all-cause mortality, we see the same thing in the aerobic training literature where people who do have higher levels of aerobic fitness have considerably lower rates of all-cause mortality than people with lower rates of aerobic fitness. Um, so, you know, it, it's the same sort of deal where more aerobic fitness seems to be good, but training like an absolute madman to, to doing a ton of super intense jogging maybe isn't necessarily the best way to promote uh, reductions in all-cause mortality. Uh, and I'll also note that the aerobic training literature and the strength training literature um, are similar insofar as the the outcome of interest. So what is your aerobic fitness? How strong are you? How much muscle do you have? Seems to be associated with larger differences in all-cause mortality than the actual training to promote those things. So basically having really high levels of aerobic fitness is predictive of a pretty large reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, doing aerobic training is associated with a reduction in all-cause mortality, but not as large as the reduction uh, observed with simply having really high levels of aerobic fitness. Same thing with resistance training. Doing resistance training is associated uh, with reductions in all-cause mortality rates, but those reductions don't seem to be as large as the simple difference in mortality between people who are just very strong in old age and people who aren't. So, you know, the, the characteristic is predictive of uh, pretty large differences in mortality. The actual training to promote the adaptations uh, uh, related to those physical characteristics are also associated with reductions in all-cause mortality, but not as large as just differences in the characteristic itself. And so, I think that's worth noting. So one, like the the stuff with resistance training, it's it's not just kind of a one-off thing. We see something very similar with cardio as well. Um, and I think that the question raised uh, has a pretty, ha has at least one uh, potential and I think very likely answer. So, you know, if if being stronger and having more muscle is predictive of lower rates of all-cause mortality, um, you know, why isn't resistance training and, and as much of it as possible predictive of similarly large reductions in all-cause mortality? And, and I think that's just because when you're dealing with those characteristics, you know, not who's training for what, but just simply as you're entering old age, who has higher aerobic fitness, who has more muscle mass, who has more strength? I think that's more just reflective of genetics, but also lifestyle kind of throughout your entire life. So, you know, if you're, um, if you hit like 60, 70, you're still, you still have a fair bit of muscle. You're still in pretty good shape. More often than not, that means you've lived a generally healthy, generally active lifestyle up to that point. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's basically, <laughs> it's basically a question of like, um, or it's a matter of, you know, if you're going to live 80 years, like the first 70 years of your life, that's, that's the bulk of your life. And all of the stuff you did during that time is going to influence how the next 10, 15, 20 years for you go versus, you know, if you lived a generally inactive, not particularly healthy life for the first 70 years of your life, and you pick up some resistance training, pick up some cardio, that is probably going to be good for you, but it, and, and I certainly wouldn't discourage people from doing that, but it's probably not going to be quite as helpful as it would have been to have been more active for the previous 70 years. And so I, I think that's basically what's going on. And the other thing to note is that es especially for the metas and, uh, and cross-sectional studies that are looking just at you know, do people with more muscle mass live longer than people with less muscle mass? What what those studies tend to do is they just uh, put people into quartiles and just compare between quartiles. So how long do people in the very top quartile of muscle and strength live versus the people in the lowest quartile of muscle and strength? And getting into that top quartile doesn't require <laughs> training like you want to be a world-class powerlifter. 
So j- just think about everyone you know in their 60s and 70s. Uh, and just think like, hey, where where would the 75th percentile of muscle and strength fall? You know, like probably a very small minority of people you know who are approximately that age are still legitimately super strong and jacked. Like, you know, most of them, like people people who probably haven't even lifted weights and are just like kind of active would probably be be in that top quartile. Um so, you know, that's what we're talking about. Like, if you're in decent aerobic shape, you have a decent amount of muscle, you have a decent amount of strength, that tends to be reflective of of living a pretty good life up to that point. And being in good shape, having more muscle, having more strength, being predictive of lower rates of all-cause mortality doesn't necessarily imply that training to maximize your aerobic fitness, you know, like trying to set the the marathon world record for people in the 80 year old age class, uh, or, you know, trying to absolutely maximize muscle and strength. It, it's, it's not necessarily implied that you need to do those things to reap the longevity benefits of generally being in good aerobic shape, generally having a decent bit of muscle, generally having a decent bit of strength. Like there's, there's that disconnect between the physical characteristic itself, which, you know, training does go into, but also just your lifestyle throughout your entire lifespan and your genetics, like all of those things affect that versus just the training component itself. So it's, it's logical to assume that if you train for a p- particular physical outcome and that physical outcome itself is predictive of all cause mortality, the training itself will be similarly predictive of shifts in all-cause mortality of a similar magnitude uh but that that just isn't the case yeah those are those are important clarifications and elaborations uh and i think the my main takeaway is if you are uncomfortable with uncertainty uh probably best to be a rationalist more so than an empiricist (laughs) because sometimes we get these empirical findings that come along and you're like damn now I got to make sense of all this. Yeah. And usually the explanation is a 15 minute talk like that, not just like a two second, like, well, Hey, it's good for your heart. Well, y- you know, so one, one thing I'll point out is you can, you can tell a lot about someone's biases based on how they talk about epidemiological research. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, like my, my bias is that lifting weights is fucking good for you and you should do it. And so I, I would love to be able to look at a meta that shows, oh, people in the top quartile of muscle mass tend to live longer than the people in the lower, lowest quartile of muscle mass. Therefore, you know, train like a power lifter and you're going to live forever. Like right. that, I, I would love to be able to make that leap. And in my younger years, I probably have made that leap before. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, that that isn't that isn't reflective of, of empirical reality. Like, you know, like my whole talk was just about, there's a difference between the physical characteristic, having more muscle versus having less muscle and, uh, actions you would take to try to move along that continuum at a particular point in time. Like those, those are similar, but they're not identical. But if you, if you're willing to assume that they're the same thing in in your, you're first willing to assume that that finding more muscle uh, predictive of lower all-cause mortality than less muscle, if you're one, just willing to accept that that is that that is strictly causal. It doesn't even cross your mind that that might be a spurious correlation. And then you're willing to jump to the next level of, therefore, everyone should be doing as much resistance training as possible. You know, that's uh, that's not necessarily reflective of the evidence. That's reflective of your biases. Um versus you know if if some other you know maybe you're a fiber skeptic and a meta comes out saying oh fiber is good for you uh you know then you're not you're not going to in- interface with that the same way you're you're not going to say oh more muscle mass is is better than less muscle mass cool that's causal don't need don't need to investigate that further oh more fiber better than less fiber mm, that's that's probably mere association you need to be careful with this epi stuff like if if you approach findings that agree with your biases and not in those two very different ways, um, you know, that, that says more about what you want to be true than what the science actually says. 
Yeah, definitely a good point. Um, now you mentioned, uh, probably nice to exercise throughout the totality of your life rather than trying to, uh, you know, crank, crank it on when you're like 75, you know? So a question that we get a lot is something that I figured we could both offer a little bit of perspective on. I see this question all the time. Uh, Jan asked us this question and it was, uh, how to encourage people who don't exercise to start exercising and maintain it? You know, what is the approach to, uh, kind of spurring someone to engage with exercise, whether it's walking, running, cycling, or strength training. Um, now I'm going to sound like a bit of a broken record here, but most of my answer is going to be, uh, predicated on a general acceptance of self-determination theory. It's a theory in psychology. And just like any theory in psychology, uh, there are strengths and weaknesses. So in like evolution, it's just a theory. Ex like you can't, you exactly. can't take it that seriously. It, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm getting at. <laughs> uh, and probably the best analogy I could think of. Uh, but yeah, you know, th there's all sorts of competing theories in psychology. So I don't want to, th the fact that I come back to it frequently is not to suggest it's the only theory that describes human uh, thought and behavior. Um, but it is one that resonates with me and I think is really well constructed. And it does have really strong empirical support in certain contexts. Um, but before I get into the self-determination theory aspects of it, the first thing is if you're going to start encouraging someone to exercise, um, I think the, the most important thing, first of all, is to make sure that you are genuinely doing it with their best interest in mind and not with any ulterior motives. So you, it, it's critically important that you are, uh, kind of encouraging them to exercise because it's in their best interest, not because it's in your best interest. Because I think if you're trying to get somebody to exercise, but there's any degree of selfishness or personal benefit behind that, I think you're likely going to be promoting this exercise adoption probably in an unfavorable way. So, so that's the first thing is if you're trying to help someone, make sure you're really trying to help them and not trying to help yourself in some way. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, now the question is, how do we actually do this effectively? And a kind of broad summary, like a, a very basic overview of self-determination theory is that people generally have this kind of inherent intrinsic drive toward growth and learning and self-improvement and self-actualization. We do have this kind of drive to learn new things and acquire new skills and get better and better and better. Uh, that, that is kind of written in our code, but in order for us to really strive toward goals and reach toward growth and self-improvement and self-actualization, we need some basic psychological needs to be met in order to kind of set the foundation for that and to really set us up for success. And within this theory, the three main pillars are relatedness, competence, and autonomy. So in order for us to start really making these big goal related strides towards something, uh, that, that's going to be good for us, you know, some kind of self improvement or self, you know, growth or actualization, uh, relatedness refers to the fact that we, we want to feel part of something. We want to feel tapped into a community. We want to feel like this means something outside of just our personal experience with it. Uh, competence, of course, means that we have self-efficacy. We feel like we're actually capable of doing what we're setting out to do. And autonomy means that we, we have some degree of control over it. We, we have the ability to kind of, uh, set the trajectory that we're on, uh, and, and kind of set our own short and intermediate term goals and determine how we go about goal striving, not just following instructions. So what I would encourage people, oh, and I should mention that one of the huge elements of self-determination theory is the idea of motivation. And more specifically that, uh, there are distinct types of motivation that fall on a spectrum. So if you dig into the self-determination theory literature, you'll actually see figures that show this spectrum or this continuum of motivation. And on one end, it starts with a motivation. So just complete lack of motivation, which is obviously one end of, of, of the spectrum, kind of the most extreme end. On the other end of the spectrum, 
is intrinsic motivation. So, so motivation that is derived from within, uh, and then kind of the middle ground, you know, it's better than no motivation, but not as powerful, not as effective as intrinsic motivation in the middle there, you find certain forms of extrinsic motivation. And that's really important because when, when I see people trying to encourage others to adopt exercise and engage with exercise, a lot of times I feel like they're really, uh, they would be much better off if they had this theory in mind. And what I mean by that is with relatedness, a great thing you can do to help somebody adopt exercise is to let them know that you are on their team. It's a support thing. So it's not like if you don't exercise, you let me down. It's more, we're in this together. I'm here to support you. You can lean on me. And I also think it's important that you offer up the, uh, the idea that, you know, you may want some, uh, some support, uh, when you're starting this process of adopting exercise and you might not want it to be me. You might want to start exercise in a group fitness setting or join a club or a team or hire a coach or hire a trainer or, uh, you know, any number of ways that you can have some kind of social group associated with exercise. And the important thing is if you're really trying to help someone else, don't be selfish about it and say, yeah, here's some relatedness. I'm your guy, you know, and, yeah. and your relatedness as it pertains to exercise is that you rely on me as your support group. You, you have to give them the opportunity to self-select a really effective support group, which can take many different forms. Uh, the next thing, competence. Sometimes I'll see people who say, hey, you know, you should really be lifting weights and you should probably be doing it four times a week and you should probably be doing, uh, you know, a very specific form of resistance exercise but they don't give them the tools to actually feel competent, right? It's there, there, a lot of times you see people who put, just kind of shove people into the deep end and say, Hey, here's a program. It's four days a week. Half of these are like Olympic lifts or highly skilled barbell movements. Anyway, good luck. And if, by the way, if you don't adopt this successfully, you kind of suck. Yeah. Like you have to equip people with competence. Yeah. Here, here's a program called starting strength. You can learn it from this book. You don't need someone to teach you. And also one of the exercises is power cleans. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you want to make sure you're fostering relatedness in a non-selfish way. You want to make sure that you're fostering competence by either, you know, kind of guiding them through it, showing them the ropes, equipping them with resources that really are meeting them where they're at and not where you think they ought to be. Uh, and then the final thing is autonomy. So sometimes people will say, I'm gonna provide you support. So there's your relatedness. I'm going to teach you how to do this. So that's competence. But also I'm gonna insist that you do everything a very particular way. And what they do there is they detract from autonomy. They don't say, hey, there are many ways to engage in exercise. Let's explore that entire menu and you can pick the things that you like. Instead, it's like, hey, on Tuesdays we squat and you're squatting with me and you gotta squat my way. And if I like high bar and you like low bar, sorry, you're a high bar squatter. You know, like, so what, what you find is that a lot of people who have tried this in the past and failed, I think self-determination theory provides some really clear examples of why there is failure there. So you, you have to make sure that someone is able to find a support group that really resonates and works for them. You have to make sure that they have opportunities to develop the competence required to engage in exercise regularly. And you have to offer them a level of autonomy and independence so that they can really start to, to kind of foster that intrinsic motivation. But in a lot of cases, you've got people who say, no, you have to do it a certain way. Uh, you have no autonomy because I give you your programs and there's no idea of, uh, th there's not even a concept of intrinsic motivation. I'm going to tell you what to do. So your motivation comes from me, which is an extrinsic and you have absolutely no autonomy in the process. So mm -hmm. my answer is, like I said, first of all, make sure that you are truly operating with their best interest in mind and not yours and then lean on some of these pillars of <laughs> self-determination theory so that you can put them in a position to succeed, to develop that intrinsic motivation. And once someone truly feels a sense of relatedness and they feel competent and they feel like they have autonomy and they have that intrinsic motivation because you've helped them understand 
that this is truly in their best interest, I think that's where it really sticks. Yeah, that that was all very good. And my my answer was similar, but uh, but much shorter. Um, just help them find something they like doing because uh, that that accomplishes most of the intrinsic motivation bit. Almost by definition, you are intrinsically motivated to do things you like, mm-hmm. and you are not as motivated to do things you don't like. Um, and yeah, so I, th- I, do, I do think that there is a tendency, especially among serious lifters, to just assume, hey, I love lifting. Uh, here's this person. They e- Either I think they should start exercising or they think they should start exercising uh well if i love lifting everyone must love lifting so cool you're you're my training partner now and you know sometimes that clicks sometimes it doesn't uh but ultimately exercise is good if people get moving that uh you know th- that accomplishes like pro- probably 80 percent of the benefits that you could at least in terms of like health and longevity that you could hope to derive from virtually any form of exercise like just exercise itself is great um so yeah, if you can, if you can help someone find something that they like doing, um, especially if they're if they're starting with more of an extrinsic motivation, like you know maybe uh, maybe some blood work came back and it didn't look good, and they're like, oh god, I need to do something about this, uh, or like you know no judgment, maybe it's more shallow, like they can't fit into some of the clothes they used to before, and they would like to be able to do that again, so they want to exercise as part of a of a weight loss type shift in lifestyle you know those are those are mostly extrinsic motivations like you're not really exercising for the sake of exercising you're exercising because you see it as a means to an end to uh get something else or attain something else so you know that's that's all well and good for getting your foot in the door but ultimately like you mentioned intrinsic motivation far more powerful far more predictive of sticking with something long term so yeah, ultimately the name of the game is is just helping people um, just find something that they legitimately enjoy doing. And so a few different um, a few different axes to consider there is one uh, you mentioned relatedness. I, I think it's important to um, so I, I think one important axis to keep in mind is kind of what I would call a social axis. So some people prefer exercising alone some people prefer exercising with a single partner or a small group some people enjoy exercising in a larger class so help people kind of troubleshoot things along that entire axis so you know any anything from lifting alone or going for a jog alone all the way to uh you know checking out crossfit or getting into a big zumba class or something um you know those are kind of the two extreme ends of of that spectrum uh I think that kind of a, I, I think there's kind of a resistance versus aerobic type axis where, you know, both styles of exercise are good, but something kind of somewhere along that axis tends to be just a single individual sweet spot in terms of what they enjoy. So, you know, they, they can maybe try to expand their exercise palette once they find the initial thing that really clicks for them. But, you know, help them troubleshoot something along that axis to try to find something that works well for them. All the way from, you know, if you're if you're a sick fuck like me who likes powerlifting or like strongman style stuff, all the way to, you know, just just going out jogging, biking, just pure aerobic type stuff, swimming, um, you know, with something maybe like uh, like body pump or like circuit training type classes or CrossFit or something in the middle with kind of a mix of both. And then I think the third axis to consider is the competitive axis. So, you know, how, (laughs) how intrinsically competitive someone is, I I think can go a long way towards, uh, influencing whether exercise is going to click with them or not. So like, I personally am a hyper competitive person. And so any, anything where you're keeping score that like i don't even have to be good at it i just have to be able to to be somewhat competitive and be able to get some points in i'm gonna fucking love it it's great um other people are not like that at all they they want something that is you know if they're competing they're only competing against themselves or you know going even further there's really no impetus even to compete against yourself like 
what would it mean to compete against your prior best performance in Tai Chi? Like, I don't, I don't think that exists. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, that, that is another continuum from forms of exercise that are hyper competitive, maybe joining an adult sports league, uh, to things that are not competitive at all, you know, Tai Chi, yoga, going for a walk. And so I think those are kind of kind of the three axes on which virt virtually any type of exercise would fall. And so I think there's just kind of a basic troubleshooting process. Like, if you know this person, you might have a decent idea of like, ah, what kind of person are they? Are, th are they going to want to be around a bunch of other people or kind of solo? Uh, are they a more competitive person? Does, th does this person give me runner vibes or lifter vibes? And, you know, kind of maybe make the initial suggestion of like, hey, I think this type of thing would work well for you. And then they try it, and, and then you can just kind of debrief and talk about it. What did you like? What did you not like? Uh, and, you know, if you're right on the first guess, cool. Stick with it for a while. See if, you know, it wasn't just a good first impression, but the enjoyment grows and kind of becomes organic. And then they do just, just love it. Like, they legitimately enjoy it. They develop that intrinsic motivation. Cool, you're good to go. If that's not the case then just kind of try to figure out kind of along those axes where it didn't click for them. Like, you know, maybe someone tried a CrossFit class and, you know, they they enjoyed what they were doing. At like, they enjoyed the stuff they were actually doing in the class. Um, you know, they liked that there was a group of people there. Like, they enjoyed the social element of it. But they just didn't like how competitive it was. Then you could say like, oh, well, maybe try a body pump class. Like it's kind of the same thing. There's a resistance component, a cardio component. You're doing it with a group of people, but it's not as as directly competitive, you know? So so you can just kind of, you know, debrief, chat, and and troubleshoot from there and try to help them find something they enjoy doing. And then once once they find something they like, um, you know, that that's not a perfect guarantee they're going to stick with it forever, but that is a pretty strong predictor that they will stick with it, at least for a while. And, you know, even if they kind of fall out of love with that initial form of exercise in the first place, maybe by that point they've built just a habit of exercising, they've developed more self-efficacy, and they kind of feel more for themselves, like they can start uh, troubleshooting and trying new things that, that clicks with them better now. Yeah, those are great, uh, great additions, very practical. I think the one elaboration that's really helpful is related to relatedness. So the way I framed it made it seem like working out with one person is kind of related, working out with two is more related and working out with 10 is even is even better. But you're, you're very correct in the sense that relatedness can take many different forms. So some people may prefer to work out alone, but may also have the ability to pursue relatedness through just having someone to talk to about mm -hmm. how their process is going or joining a supportive Facebook group or subreddit where they can kind of see that other people are navigating the same experience or independently training for a competition and just feeling like, no, what I'm doing is actually in pursuit of being part of this competitive community, mm -hmm. you know, so that can take a lot of different forms. Uh, and you mentioned your competitiveness. Uh, people have accused me of not being competitive. Because uh, if I like play a board game or like we're just like shooting hoops or something, I'll, I'll seem very aloof and just not really that into it. Uh, and that is fully a protective mechanism because I am too competitive. <laughs> and so like from what, when I decide I'm going to be competitive about something, it's for all the marbles. So like growing up, I was like, ah, I think I'm kind of competitive about like, you know, educational attainment. And I was like, dude, I'll, I'll go to college for 10 years. I'll do it. And I don't think you will, you know, like it. And same thing, like with bodybuilding, I was like, I'll starve to death. I'll go all the way, dude. Like I will. And like, yeah, I got to the point where like the people in my department were asking if I was okay, not asking me asking around, you know, like people were, yeah. were like, Hey, is, is everything all right with that guy? And then it got, it kind of got back to me. So like, yeah, I, I'm so competitive that I cannot allow myself to compete unless I'm willing to really have a brush with death over it, basically. Yeah, r really leave your body on the field, but <laughs> yeah. but in a literal sense. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, all right, so I think that does it for this episode. But to play us out, I just have a friendly reminder. Uh, you know, we are 
I, I believe still the first and only uh, family values Christian conservative podcast uh, in the fitness world. And I just want to remind everybody that we are in uh, fact give, given uh, current events going on in the world that it, might have to drop the yeah bit. we. <laughs> At least, at least for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit too close to home. But yeah, I, I did just want to facetiously remind everybody that we are, in fact, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, I'm repenting to try to get ahead of this. Uh, so basically, the context is in 2013, my house was struck by lightning. It, just a couple days ago, a tree fell on my house. And so-called fake news meteorologists will have different explanations for what's going on. But I think I know what's happening here. I, I think these severe acts of weather happening in such close proximity to my home is a clear warning sign, uh, and I'm worried about it. But but I, like I said, I'm I'm repenting, basically hourly, trying to get ahead of this thing so that um, hopefully no more natural disasters uh, attack me in my home. And I would encourage everyone to do the same. Well, I am I am hoping for the best for you. Thank you. I have too little to play us out. Uh, related things. So in the last episode, talked about sumo and conventional deadlift a little bit. Uh, I shouted out Jeff Nippard's recent video on the topic. Uh, but what I didn't mention was the best practical tip from that video that he didn't even verbalize, but that I saw and I was like, what the fuck? Can you do that? So there's a shot in that video of Jeff eating what else? A kiwi. Guy loves kiwis. But he didn't peel it. He just bit into it like an apple. And I thought like, whoa, is is this a bit? Is he doing a character? Like he, he was kind of trying to play like a like an unhinged bad cop, bad cop uh, type type skit with uh, a, a cardboard cutout of Seabum. So I was like, maybe this is just a part of like his unhinged interrogator character yeah or maybe it's a real thing maybe you can just bite into a kiwi and you don't have to peel it and uh yeah tried it recently you fucking can you don't need to peel kiwis which was wild to me i had no idea i thought that the skin was inedible but like it's not it's kind of you know it's kind of fuzzy it's not the most pleasant texture but you can bite through it easily enough and as soon as you start chewing like you just don't notice it anymore and the thing is i really like kiwis but I never ate them just because they were such a pain in the ass to peel. So now that I know that I can just eat kiwis like apples, that's incredible. That that opens up uh, one new dietary horizon for me, which is eating more kiwis. Yeah, I had no idea. That, well, that's incredible. Now you know. I got to get on that. The other thing that I wanted to mention to play us out uh, is... <laughs> so, uh, Lindsay and I went to a to a concert this past weekend... And I caught a very small snippet of conversation between two of the ushers. And I don't know what the context for this was. I don't know what became what came before or after it. But I, I heard this one phrase. And in ruminating about it, I realized that it's probably completely banal. But it might be one of the most sinister standalone phrases <laughs> in the English language. And that's just, you know, these two you know, seemingly nice, innocuous ushers were talking to each other, and one of them says to the other, we'll outnumber them soon. And I don't know what the context for that is, but the thing is, there there are a lot of places that phrase could go that I are very scary. I can't think of a good one. Yeah, so uh, anyway, I just... The, the only time I can think of a good one is if you're playing a game of dodgeball. I guess, yeah. Or like <laughs> Red Rover. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> It, yeah, and it, it was very it was very weird because like they, like they did just seem like very pleasant. So I assumed that it was nothing scary, but I mean it was the same as you. I was going through through it in my head like we'll outnumber them soon. What what good uh, situations would you say would you say that in that like in almost all regards that's hostile takeover language. Like we're going to do something <laughs> to another group of people. Who can currently resist it, but soon they will be unable to withstand our onslaught. Like that's that's kind of the vibe. So I I just wanted to to leave you with that thought. Is that like a warning? <laughs> I don't know. 
I don't know. I don't know what they were talking about. All right. Well, on one of the more sinister notes we've ever hit on the podcast, I think that's probably a good way to close it. And we'll give everyone a week to, to think about that. Right. Uh, so as always, thank you so much for joining us. And we will be back soon with another episode. Thank you for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to sign up for our free newsletter to get concise breakdowns of relevant research, as well as 28 free training programs for all skill levels and all schedules. We hate spam just as much as you do, so we'll only email you when we have something really interesting to share with you. You can sign up for the free newsletter at strongerbyscience.com newsletter, or just go to the Stronger by Science homepage and click the free programs button at the top. If you want to join in on the Stronger by Science podcast conversation, be sure to check out our Facebook group and our subreddit. The links for both are provided in the description of today's episode. Finally, please remember that we are not medical doctors or registered dietitians. So before you make any changes to your exercise or nutrition habits, be sure to check with a qualified healthcare professional. Once again, thank you for listening, and we will be back soon with another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast.